Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to my true crime podcast. Today is January 21st, 2023, and um, I am going to be talking about something many of you have been asking me questions on, and that's going to be Father Flanagan. So for those of you who are not aware of who Father Flanagan is, he is the priest that ran Boys Town. And Boys Town, many of you will already know, is where many of the victims that were used in the Franklin child abuse case were gotten from. So I went back and I did my digging through someone's life and I've come up with his history that I'm going to share with you today. Uh, but I want you to look out for red flags, you know, like Hollywood is a red flag. The military is a red flag. And so I have all sorts of goodies for you today. This is a special um, episode because there's a lot of information I'm going to cover. But first, I want to thank you for subscribing because my goal, as I've been telling you for a couple of weeks, is to get to 10,000 subscribers by February. Today is the 21st. We still have some time. And I know that many of you who listen to my show on a regular basis don't subscribe. So please subscribe. And of course, like the video. <laughs> like the video. I hope you guys are well. I am finally... I think at my 95% of getting better, having been horribly ill since the beginning of December, but hooray, hooray, um, you know, all bad things come to an end and there's always a, a lot of very good things that um, await you if you've been given a, a bad couple of weeks or something happens. So it's always good to remain optimistic. So, um, I've told you about the red flags to look for. I'm going to go into his history, but before I do that, I want to say that um, uh, pedophilia within the Catholic Church, and and yes, it it it's extended to other religions and other places of worship. But today, I'm going to focus on the Catholic Church because we're going to talk about Father Flanagan. Uh, but that that first pedophile pope. Uh, lived in the fourth century, and that was Saint Damascus. Um, the Catholic Church was afraid that the truth could be revealed, and they left him in place. And then there have been at least um, another very well known uh, pedophile priest uh, up until like the 1400s. So I'm sorry, popes, popes, not priests. So imagine how many priests. I also recently made a connection of a pedophile priest who was very close to John Paul Pope II. And I will have to do that podcast in a separate because it's it it shows how high the information travels. And so with that sort of like little preface, you know, that it's not a new thing, that pedophilia within the Catholic Church has been around since the fourth century. And who knows, you know, since the beginning, um, I, you know, I will let you know that in 1938, now this is your first red flag. In 1938, MGM decided to create a movie called Boys Town. It starred Spencer Traney. But Spencer Traney? No, Spencer Tracy. Okay, maybe I'm still a little bit sick, but okay, let's just keep going. Spencer Tracy, uh, who played the role of Father Flanagan, and Mickey Rooney, who portrayed the troubled boy. Um, and the film, at the end of the film, I don't know if any of you have watched it. It's an old film, but at the very end, because they used to play it on TV all the time when I was a kid. Uh, there was always a the address for Boys Town in Omaha, Nebraska, and they always solicited donations from the public. Uh, Spencer Tracy went on to receive an Oscar 
for his performance. And the movie uh, went on to make Mickey Rooney one of the popular actors of all time. So we do know, you know, talking about that red flag, that Hollywood is an arm of the CIA. Uh, so there's no bigger deception than that movie, Boys Town, um, about this orphanage in Omaha, Nebraska. So it was founded in 1917 by a Catholic priest named Edward Joseph Flanagan. Um, I'm going to just try to skip over a lot of this information and come back uh, to it in a bit. I have a photograph of him as a young man. He was born um, I mean, he was born in Ireland, but I also found that, you know, uh, there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened in Ireland, right? What comes to mind is Jimmy Savile, who traveled to our, our Ireland um, to abuse boys. But Flanagan himself was born in 1886 in the village of Ballymo. County Galway, Ireland. His parents were John and Honoria Flanagan. They were farmers, but they were relatively well off. John was a herdsman and his wife cared for the children. They lived with John's parents and it was a crowded home with lots of work that kept the children busy. Uh, they were devout Catholics and they attended services regularly. Edward was the eighth child in a family of 11 children. He was born prematurely and the family was told that he might not survive. His grandfather um, started to care for the child, uh, hoping to, you know, save the baby's life. And so what he did was he kept him wrapped up in a blanket, lying on his chest, next to the hearth in the kitchen for the first few weeks and he survived so he grew up to be very frail he wasn't really assigned the tasks that were considered to be difficult and so he was pretty much the more doted upon child because he was frail and he was not really uh, given any hard things to do when he became older his parents made the decision for him that he was better suited to become a priest with the Roman Catholic Church. And when he was in school, he attended a school called Clune Bonif Primary School. Then he moved on to Summerhill College. Uh, it's a school for boys where he graduated in 1904. Now, it's fair to conclude that life had to be somewhat difficult for him. He was a mama's boy. He regularly became ill, and it was an all-boy school. So it's fair to say, it's fair to think that he was probably bullied. And, you know, all-boy schools are notorious for all kinds of um, outrageous behavior. Uh, so... Wanting to know more about his parents' lifestyle and what afforded them the luxury of sending several of their children to the United States, I tracked down a, a, a scholarly journal with insights to help me figure out what was happening in Ireland at the time. And so what I came away with was that the herdsmen mentality was that they were conscientious of being employees. They worked hard and they had aspirations of being respectable. Um, I'm going to read you a, an excerpt that I actually used for one of my articles about my research. And this was written in the early 1820s. Shepherds usually have, shepherds have usually a house, small garden, some tillage ground, and grass for cow, and generally keeping for a brood mare. As they are servants of some respectability, they have commonly many indulgences, and no person would take a herd without 
his possessing some stock as they are frequently the only security from neglect or misdemeanor. And so this is the type of home that Edward Joseph Flanagan was reared in. Uh, so far from the single parent poverty stricken homes that one day the boys that would live at Boys Town would be, you know, those boys were boys that had, you know, no parent or had no one to care for them. So Edward Joseph Flanagan came from a family who cared for him and who had the means to care for him. In 1904, he set sail for America with his sister to go live with their older brother, who was also a priest. Uh, his name was Patrick Flanagan. And uh, he was a priest at St. Patrick's Church in Omaha, Nebraska. So Edward, who wasn't as shy as he let on, brought along all the 32 countries. He, he, he brought along with him, and I'm going to try to explain this. So there are different parts of Ireland. And he knew that there had been a very large migration to the United States from Ireland. And so he went about before going on this moving to the United States, collecting grass from all the different areas. We can call them towns, districts, you know, there are different different areas. He collected grass from each one of them. Uh, apparently there are 32 different districts or at least there were at the time. And so once he arrived in the United States, he sold this native oil I'm sorry, this native soil to other Irish immigrants. And he charged each one of them a dollar. Now, back in that time, a dollar was a lot of money. He then had to learn to hone his speaking skills because priests, while it's not necessarily something that we are cognizant of, if you've ever been inside a Catholic church, but what they do is they give a sermon, right? So public speaking is very important and the ability to not be shy in front of a large group of people is also very important. So he had to learn uh, to um, hone his speaking skills, which is the very first thing that he did. So in, by 1919, he becomes a citizen of the United States. But before that, he had he crosses back and forth uh, several times to complete his education. So he would go, he went back to Europe. The first stop was Mount St. Mary's University. Um, and then it's it's sort of like the largest private Roman Catholic seminary. And there he received a Bachelor of Arts in 1906 and a Master of Arts degree in 1908. Now, once again, he became ill, he got pneumonia, and he would regularly get pneumonia and become ill since he was a child. During the, the time that he was sick, he would find his way back to his siblings so that his sister could take care of him. So basically, to say that he was coddled would be a fair assessment. So once he recovered, he went on his way again to another high-ranking school. And so this time he continued his studies at St. Joseph's Seminary in Dunwoody, New York. And that's basically part of the Archdiocese of New York. And it's located about 16 miles north of the Cathedral of St. Patrick in Midtown Manhattan. And of note, Epstein's, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's Madison uh, at Avenue office in New York City is just across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral, and it's on the land owned by the Archdiocese. I mean, the Archdiocese, frankly, is one of the largest landowners in New York City, the second being, um, or maybe they're nose to nose at this point, the second being um, Columbia University. So during this time, Flanagan also traveled to Italy, where he served a term as an Advent preacher at St. Sylvester's Basilica in Rome. What I did was I pulled up a photograph, 
maybe I'll use this for my cover photo. I don't know, but it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful basilica. It's it's a, you know in the classical style. It's 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 beautiful. Um, so this might be a good time to include a little history about the Vatican, which is really the world's smallest country. So while it's small in size, its history stretches back centuries with more sex and financial scandals than anyone can ever list. So the Vatican didn't make it into the Godfather with Marlon Brando for nothing. Um, I think that many of you might remember uh, a well-known book about um, the Vatican and the the banker uh, and their role in the pizza connection and their role in 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 um, in in several scandals that were exposed um, by a couple of very good authors. One book was I believe I believe it was called um, uh, the Vatican's bank or banker i'll have to look for that maybe i'll include it in my notes below so the first uh pope to have resigned from the throne uh was pope benedict the ninth and he resigned in uh 1036 just four years after he sat on it at the tender age of 20 and the reason for this is it's because he was a sexual deviant with every sort of sinful behavior he had orgies and it didn't include just men, but it included animals. It, you know, it had men, women, and animals. And this is like, he's, he's, he's a young man and he liked rape and he liked murdering. So this is the kind of stuff that we've heard whispers, right? That happened on Epstein's, let's say, island whispers of this kind of behavior and this is like such a long time ago this is well over a, a thousand just shy this is almost a thousand years ago uh so that's the way the catholic church has sort of hidden all of the um scandals uh continues to be astonishing to me uh, how it survived still with so many men continuing to step forward as adults to talk about their experience is um, it's a mystery to me. And the only thing that makes sense is that it, like other institutions that I'll talk about at another time, is that the Catholic Church is also uh, sort of a, an intelligence gathering place. Where else can you hear the secrets of parishioners if not behind the, you know, the confessional? So that's another red sign. If if there's massive uh, depravity and massive um, uh, scandals and people are being harmed and actually murdered, the doors of whatever it is would be closed they remain open because there's a function that is that 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 is needed and it, it's my opinion based on all of the information i've come across that the catholic church is an another arm of the intelligence services okay so let's go back to flanagan so he returns to Omaha because his health took a turn for the worse, as it always did, and his long-suffering sister nursed him back to health. So once he recovered, he crossed the Atlantic Ocean again, where he finally completed his studies for the priesthood at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. In 1912, he became finally an ordained priest. And he gave his very first mass at St. Ignatius Church with many of his family members present. He then moved back to Nebraska where he became an assistant to his brother in Omaha. So what happened was there was a, a, a day that changed his life and that would signal the beginning of what we know as Boys Town. 
And that day is March 23rd, 1913. That's when his life was forever changed. And what happened was the deadliest tornado in the history of the state arrived. It was um, an early Easter Sunday. The day had begun very sunny, very spring-like. And then suddenly there was a very large black mushroom cloud that appeared out of nowhere. And within 35 minutes, the tornado had moved across 40 miles of Nebraska. So this changed his life because what happened was that the tornado killed 155 people. It destroyed one third of the city. Hundreds of people were left homeless and many were immediately out of work. So it's at this point that Flanagan opens his first shelter for men. And he did this by purchasing an old hotel called the Old Burlington Hotel. He recruited a group of homeless men and he let them come in and live in the hotel under the condition that they clean and repair. So that basically they were homeless. He gave them not a great roof over their head, but it was better than living on the street. And as long as they cleaned and helped to repair the building, they could stay there. So this suited Flanagan. And then he went on to acquire an even larger property where he was able to house a thousand men. When the United States entered the war, meaning World War I, uh, most of those men that he had uh, given housing to enlisted. And so then he decided, okay, I'm going to offer shelter to boys. If we can all go back in time, I'm sure we would all at that moment interfere and say, no, you don't. But so the, but this too went through stages until 1918 when he obtained the deed to Overlook Farm. Uh, to which he added five new buildings, and then he had it incorporated as a separate town, and he named it Boys Town in 1922. So from 1922, you know, he builds it. It's literally a town. It's got its own post office. It's got it, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you can't really leave it. Everything is there. Um, on April 7, 1947, Flanagan at the age of 61 was called upon by the United States War Department to tour Japan and Korea to investigate the need for aid to war orphans. General Douglas MacArthur met, met him, um, and then, you know, three months later in July, Flanagan goes to the White House where he personally sits down with the current president, Harry Truman, and he reports his findings. So that's another red flag, right? So he's 61. The War Department decides to call him to tour Japan and Korea to investigate the need for aid for war orphans. To me, when I when I first came across this information several years ago, I'm like, OK, there it goes. Ding, ding, ding. You know, you, you don't get to sit with the president because that's another sort of similar thread. So we know that Boys Town uh, Lawrence King was able to connect with Ronald Reagan directly. And then now we find out that Father Flanagan had a direct connection to Harry Truman, which means that anything he did was either under the direction of the administration and the intelligence services, because it could not have necessarily come from that level, right? So we, we begin to see the signs of what I have been saying in almost all of my podcasts, in almost every one of my books, that these trafficking rings are interconnected and they are all sort of part of the intelligence apparatus. 
Now that doesn't take away the fact that we have priests and apparently popes who have been child molesters. But if they were doing that without the support of the group above them, which would be the government, right? Or the intelligence agency, and then you know, with the with the I, I suppose the agreement of the sitting president, they would not be able to really get away with that. So okay, he reports his findings to Harry Truman. Truman is satisfied with the information, and he says, "You know what, Flanagan, you did a good job. I'm going to send you to Germany. Remember, this is Germany, Nazi Germany. It's right after the war." And so, you know, that's really the, the the point in time when I start to think not only is this an intelligence operation, but in fact, Flanagan may, be, may have been a spy and it's worth looking into. So I, I would encourage you if you are into research and you want to research, that's an area that has not been explored. Was Father Flanagan a spy? I think, yeah, I think he was carrying on an operation similar to the operation that Jeffrey Epstein carried. He, you know, he was sort of like the provider, as was Jeffrey Epstein, as was Craig Spence, as was Larry King. That's the way that sort of the information is presenting itself to me. Um, well, something happened to uh, Flanagan when he is still in Germany. And that's that on May 15, 1948, he suffers a fatal heart attack. By this time, um, we know that the intelligence services are already accustomed to murdering people who know too much. So we will never know if he suffered a, an actual heart attack or if this was actually an assassination because he had learned perhaps too much. Um, here's what happens. I, 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 I'll tell you what happens. Um, well, let me tell you this first. So his body is flown back to Boys Town where he's given like two extra, not one, but two extravagant funerals. Uh, President Truman makes a special trip to Boys Town on June 5th, 1948, where he lays a wreath on Father Flanagan's tomb. You could probably uh, do a search for that on any search engine and probably come up with a photograph of President Truman's trip to Boys Town. Again, that was on June 5th, 1948. So what's very, um, remember how we started the conversation with the film? Boys Town? Well, less than one year later, in March of 1949, Charles Manson, then 14 years old, is featured in a full-page article in the Indianapolis News, and he's described as a dead-end boy who lived in an emotional blind alley, and he is, quote, happy today, end quote. And so the 14-year-old Manson is seen shaking the hand of the judge who has just told him he's going to Boys Town. I don't know if any of you have seen the full page article with a photo of um, the judge shaking hands with Charles Manson and wishing him luck on his trip to Boys Town. By this point in time, Charles Manson had already been in another juvenile home where he didn't like it because he was being abused there and they were sending him to Boys Town. Well, what I thought about this article, uh, it seemed to me, and I actually found another one that's similar with a friend of Glenn Maxwell's who I will not name in this episode, but you will find that information in my, my books clearly. Um, is that 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 seemed to me like an ad. It seemed to me there's a full page story about 14 year old Charles Manson, who nobody knows about yet, going to Boys Town. 
And it seemed to me that it that's as much of an ad for possibly other pedophiles as the movie was. Because it's very unusual uh, to find, you know, it just, it was, if we didn't, if, if Charles Manson didn't turn out to be who he was and wasn't part of the MK Ultra program, because he is connected to the Epstein situation, and I've written a couple of articles about that, and nobody really talks about that connection. And there's like this strand that connects a lot of these, what appear to be different, um, different uh, criminals or different um, catastrophic events. There's a, a thread that goes through all of them that comes back and it's all leading to the same place. So he goes to Boys Town, but he doesn't like it. He's already sexually abused after being there only two weeks. Um, in 1990, one of the victims of the Franklin child abuse uh, scandal said that one of the experiences that he had was that... Um, Lawrence King and Lawrence King also worked with Craig Spence was that he had been flown to Area 51. Area 51 is a highly classified United States Air Force facility. It's at the center of a lot of conspiracies surrounding UFOs and alien beings. And uh, he said it was one of the places they use because of the fact that it's you, no civilians are around. There's no chance of anybody seeing anything that happens there where they would take children as young as three and auction them off. Um, so... And, you know, there's, there's, there's so much here that I can keep going into. Um, however, I, I, what I'll say is that um, some of the people who were involved in the Franklin child abuse case seem to overlap with some of the people that were involved in the Epstein case. Mainstream hasn't really... Uh, delved into any of this. I know that I did, and I've written a couple of articles where the overlap is is clear, and I mention names. Um, however, I wanted to keep this relevant to Father Flanagan uh, to give you a background information on what the red flags were during his lifetime, how Boys Town came to be. Uh, what allowed him to sort of like keep this thing going and how it transitioned into becoming um, the place from where someone like Lawrence King could just walk in and pull children out. And it seems to me that it was always like that. It, it seems to me that before Larry King and... Um, Craig Spence started their uh, Franklin child abuse uh, ring. It seemed to me that, um, because look, if we look at what Manson said many, many years ago, he was already sexually abused and he, ha he ran away after two weeks. Um, and then we know that there are allegations or there's like suspicion that Manson was also uh, part of a, a covert operation and he's connected to all sorts of other things. So anyway, I'm going to say that um, I can't wait to hear your, your comments on this. And um, I hope you guys are well. Like the video, subscribe. Okay, talk soon. Bye.